Hello. Uh, yeah, it's called Jackass and Fascinating. I wrote a book about it. I don't make my living writing books, but uh, I make my living by trading. But about 15 years ago, I'd just been hearing so many myths you know, just perpetuated about investing that I started writing those down, ended up with dozens of them, narrowed it down to 20, and wrote a book about it. And Jackass Investing, my, my definition of that is taking unnecessary risks with your money. And you'll see kind of the theme through my talk is that most of what everybody's taught to do with conventional investment wisdom is jackass investing. It's taking unnecessary risk with your money. And if anybody would like a uh, complimentary copy of the book, just give me your email and I'll send it over to you. I'll send links for the iBook and, and, uh, and Kindle versions of that. Okay, so we're not going to hit 20 myths today, but I do have five myths that I'd like to cover. You can see those here. And <clears throat> there, some of these are... Um, you know, just really ingrained in, in the mindset and conventional wisdom. What I'm going to show you is not just the myth, though. It's how we exploit the myth with our trading. So I'll give you some specific examples of strategies that we employ to, to exploit the myth. <clears throat> First myth, can't time the market. Well, this pretty much shows that people, in general, can't time the market. All the Delbar studies consistently over the last couple decades have shown that people underperform the very funds into which they invest by, on average, 5% a year. The bond funds are even worse. It's about 6% per year. So normally, you'd look at this and say, well, that supports the myth. They can't time the market. It's not possible. But the very fact that they can't time the market is the reason that you, we, can time the market. And let me let uh, Jerry Seinfeld explain that. Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. <laughs> My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, be it something to wear, something to eat, it's often wrong. Now, how many investors feel like that, right? So Jerry had the most insightful response to that. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> so I'm going to just show you the last scene because it's so great how George then exploits this. Excuse me, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered the same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. I'm Victoria. Hi. <laughs> well, aside from showing why this was such a great TV show, um, <clears throat> This also explains what you can do to exploit the myth that people can't time the market. And that's to simply fade what other people do. So we developed a trading strategy that's looking at uh, ETF money flows. And we're looking at the aggressive US equity ETFs. We do it now with bond ETFs as well. So the, the triple average or the inverse ETFs um, or the narrow sector ETFs and see when there's money flowing in there aggressively favoring the long side, we're looking for a point where we say, OK, that's, that's the time to fade that move. It's time to go short, and vice versa on the opposite side. It's a very simple strategy. I actually describe the strategy specifically on the website for the book at, at jackassinvesting.com. There's an action section you can see there, and it just walks through and it tells you what ETFs we're looking at and uh, when we put a buy in, a, in and a sell in. Um, now, we trade about 140 markets globally. This is just US equity markets are one of those. Um, but the strategy, what's really nice about it, is you end up with returns, certainly that beat just a buy and hold type return, but with far less exposure. You've got 22% time in market as opposed to 100%. So it's a great way of exploiting that fact that people can't time the market. Another one is a strategy that's based on something similar. It's both value and sentiment based. This is trading the commodities. We, we apply it to 21 different commodity markets. And it's looking for markets that are trading at or near their marginal cost of production, essentially at, at deep value. And they get there because sentiment just goes negative on them. Orange juice in 2004, you know, we started accumulating long positions in there. And at that time, up to 9% of the US population was on the Atkins diet. If you guys remember the Atkins diet, it just shunned carbohydrates. People wouldn't drink orange juice. It was bad. It was evil. You know, All you would eat was fat. That was the Atkins diet. Um, kind of fell out of disfavor when Atkins died on the street and he looked kind of fat. But the uh, idea was at this time that there was an advantage to buying markets that are depressed from sentiment and trading at below their true market value and then selling out of those on subsequent rallies. <clears throat> okay, so a second myth, everybody knows 
football fans aren't, aren't rational. I, I started a company in my venture capital days called uh, Freewire that was creating fan channels. We had 80 professional NFL players that were a fan, had fan channels on Freewire, and we updated their bios and their performance and uh, news about them on their sites, and they'd get in there and they'd, they'd chat with other fans, and the fans would you know, become fans of the players and so on. But one of the things we did on there was we let each week the fans tell us what team was going to win. And across the, the season, across all games, the fans overwhelmingly picked their home team to win. No rational thinking here at all. They just wanted this to happen. So that's what they picked. And in this one, this was an Eagles game against the Giants. I'm from Philadelphia. Um, and the Eagles fans, 93% of the Eagles fans said the Eagles were going to win. And you had 74% of the Giants fans saying the Giants were going to win. Well, there's only been, I think, 19 ties in NFL history since they started the, the tie breaking. So it's really 50-50 who's going to win. But they favor it this way. Well, we know that these guys are irrational, a little crazy, but institutional investors are the same. This is a um, <clears throat> chart that shows the percentage of their investments for institutional investors domiciled in different countries in their home country stocks. And they just they dominate their investments in their home country stocks. Now, some of this is regulatory. They might be restricted. So they're not maybe the irrational guys. It might be the regulators that are being irrational, which is everywhere. Um, but in, in this case, you know, in some cases, these people, they have the opportunity to diversify globally. They just choose not to. And there's all sorts of excuses why they is more comfortable with their home country. They understand those companies better. But there's no reason they can't learn about a company domiciled in the U.S. if they're based in France. So what you can do, though, and, and what they should be doing, and what this opens up, is the opportunity to, to, to trade in hundreds of other markets um, that are less trod, you know, that people aren't, you know, uh, dominating so much with so much research or information, and they, they're avoiding that. You know, that's, that's the approach I take to go into something like orange juice. Well, maybe, you know, there's, there's not so many entrenched interests that are um, dominating that, that market. You, you've got some better opportunities, more inefficiencies in that market. The other thing is that these large investors, not only do they tend to be irrational, I define irrational, they have rational reasons why they do the irrational. I define irrational as not trying to maximize the return for any given level of risk, jackass investing. And if they're not maximizing their return for their given risk, they're taking unnecessary risk. I consider that irrational. Um, it may be career reasons that they do what they do. There's a lot of reasons people do what they do that's very rational for them, but not for maximizing return basis of risk. But, you know, Roger Robertson did a uh, study. This one maybe you guys have seen. It's, there's a number of these, you know, different studies showing different factors that drive equity prices. This is one you can exploit, you know, quite easily because it's showing that the smaller investors, at least the smaller investors can exploit it quite easily. The less liquid stocks outperform by well over 10% annually, the most liquid larger cap stocks. And <clears throat> there, there are just certain things that you can do like this that exploit the fact that maybe, you know, trade global markets, trade commodities, trade things that the institutions aren't doing, trade the stocks they're unable to trade, that it can exploit some of these, these sort of inefficiencies that are in the market. Um, okay, so another one, it's best to trust expert opinions, follow expert advice. <clears throat> The, the studies that are out there, and I, I talk about some of these in the book, show that the more expert somebody becomes, the more renowned they are as being an expert, the less reliable their advice becomes. And you think about it, it kind of makes sense. You know, if you've got a guy and he's a gold bug and he's telling everybody on the news and on, you know, the talk shows day after day that gold's going up and gold's going up, it's hard for him to change his opinion. It's very difficult to all of a sudden say, you know what, I'm going to be a, a trader here and it doesn't look good. I think we want to be selling gold. So he'll ride that gold all the way to the bottom. Joe Granville, if everybody remembers Joe Granville or anybody, in, in 1980 when I started trading was the global guru. And I, I talk about it in my book where he would, he would move the market when he made a, a buy or a sell decision. And then he started predicting earthquakes. And then as Halbert showed in his market newsletter, he was the worst performing investment guru over the last, I, I don't, the last time I saw it was maybe 10 years ago, but that 20 year period with a negative 99% return, I mean, he was just off. He actually made the quote that I will never again make a serious mistake in my trading. 
back in 1980, 82. So as soon as you see hubris walk away is one example. But this was a, this was a great study that this, uh, Tetlock did, which was trying to determine <clears throat> um, sort of this, this predictive ability. And it pitted rats in a maze that was that T-shaped maze that had food on one side of the maze 60% of the time, 40% on the other, with Yale students to try to predict where the food was going to go. The rats pretty quickly figured out that most of the time, say it was on the left side, and they would go left, and they got it right 60% of the time. The Yale students, 53. Essentially, statistically random. They were trying to overthink, outpredict, find patterns in the placement of the food. The rats didn't care. They just knew that most of the time, if I went to the left, I was going to get the food. So <clears throat> that's something you see you know, with, with experts and people. They start reading too much into their own uh, analysis um, and, and come up with wrong decisions and, and, and wrong conclusions. <clears throat> well, you have that with analysts. This is um, something I think that um, McKinsey published that was showing forecasts and actual earnings for companies. And what you see is the, the analysts were just way off the mark. And this is, this is a pretty extended period, and it just continues like this. It didn't get any better in the financial meltdown, um, <clears throat> where they're, the analysts are just way off the mark. What we do with this, this type of behavior, is we've got event strategies that are looking at market reaction following events. Friday's employment report is an example. You've got experts that are sitting there, and they're on the, they're on the talking head show saying, 180, 185, whatever the number is going to be. And it comes in 169, and the markets go, oh, I didn't like that. It does something. Well, those reactions to those, um, those reports give us an indication of where the experts were lined up beforehand and where the market wants to go after that. So we've got event strategies that track before and after behavior for events. And trade, generally, it's a, a short-term effect. We'll get maybe up to a month or so, uh, most usually two months after an event, where whatever was wrong gets wrung out of the market and it gets back to you know, waiting for the next event to happen. You know, so in our case on the employment report, we'll find out if it works or not. It's a strategy that's about 60% of the profitable, 60% of the time, which we really like. But um, we, we ended up buying euro dollars on Friday after the, uh, the employment report. So we'll see how that goes over the next month. We're, essentially, it's betting on short-term interest rates declining. Now, this is, we're in deferred contracts. This is the, the March 16 contract. So, you know, the expectation of higher rates is uh, out in the future should start to lower based on our experience and based on that event. Um, okay, so the, the last two big myths are uh, you can diversify across asset classes, diversify across sectors and markets, um, countries, to lower risk. <clears throat> and there is no free lunch, the final myth. So I want to just show that here we are. The this is a, correl just a simple correlation matrix of, you know, whatever it is, 10 sectors, broad sectors, saying um, in a bull market period, so this is from the low in October of two up to October 2007, correlation among the different sectors. And you can see there's, there's a fair amount of white, and there's some, you know, lighter gray. Darker gray means higher correlated. So you actually got some value in diversifying during the bull market across multiple sectors. But it reminds me of the uh, movie Butch Casting the Sundance Kid. In that movie, when Butch and Sundance decided to go straight, they're not going to be bank robbers anymore, they took a job guarding the payroll for a mining company. And they're coming down the mountain, and Butch and, and Sundance are looking all around behind the rocks, trees and bushes, and saying they, they're hiding there. They'd be there. And I'm thinking, well, they know. These guys are bandits. They know how to find where a bad guy is going to be hiding to ambush them. And the old curmudgeon guy riding down with them says, you know, uh, what is that, uh, amateurs or something like that, idiots. You know, I've got morons. You know, and, and they're going, well, no, we're trying to figure out where we're going to be attacked. He says, morons, we're going down the mountain. We have no gold for the payroll when we're going down the mountain. They're not going to attack us going down the mountain. They're only going to attack us going up the mountain. Well, what I see with the correlations in sectors is that you need the protection going down the mountain. That is where you need it. And unfortunately, that's exactly where you don't get it. You, you get market declines, and everything tends to correlate higher. So the idea of diversifying across market sectors to provide diversification value Great, it does it on the way up, but you don't need it on the way up. You need it on the way down. And it's even worse with countries. 
you know, country correlations are high to start with, even in bull markets. In a bear market, the financial crisis, everything's correlated. There's absolutely no value in diversifying across uh, different countries. So what that leads to is the whole idea of making a um, portfolio using asset classes, sector diversification. Asset classes started out as very simple. And it really goes back to the early 1960s when people started um, trying to evaluate uh, the, the opportunities for diversification by looking at individual stocks, realized that the computing power really wasn't up to it at that point. So they needed to classify and group different assets into like categories. And you really start out with you had stocks and bonds. It's evolved. You end up with now subcategories, some of the sectors maybe that we're looking at, or mid caps, or large caps, or you know, foreign, international, whatever it might be, uh, throw in some real estate to end up with a, a more diversified portfolio. <coughs> But the problem that you have, and when I was to go back to the, one of the couple of earlier trading strategies I was talking about, the ETF sentiment strategy, or the orange juice trading marginal cost of production, or the event-based strategy, those are all trading strategies based on a sound logical premise that we call a return driver. And if you have, every strategy has a return driver as a basis for it. All asset classes are, are like assets that are powered by similar return drivers. And when you look at it, you'll see that there's very low, uh, very little diversification value across the various asset classes. They're all driven by the same return drivers, which means you have an event risk that's super high. You really don't have diversification value with this. And the only way you get that is diversifying across return drivers. So what you see is this type of an effect. Financial crisis hits. You really need diversification. And in this case, the only thing that provided it were bonds, the top two lines. Everything else that was in that s sort of diversified portfolio dropped, which is why you had a conventional portfolio with 30% plus drawdowns from peak to trough during the financial crisis. <clears throat> so what is going on in the industry, which I'm finding amusing, are things like some of the big institutional asset managers, for example, realizing that they've got to pigeonhole other return drivers in, and, and call them asset classes. Because everybody wants to trade an asset class. Everybody's been trained. You, you diversify across asset classes, right? So BlackRock's now sitting there saying, you know what? Volatility, stock market volatility, it's, it's a great, it's, it's, it should be an asset class by itself. Because they want to put it in a portfolio because it's uncorrelated to the other asset classes in the portfolio. It will provide them with diversification value. And, they're aware, and I'm sure a lot of these big institutions are aware, that as bad as the correlations lined up during the financial crisis in, in 2008, it would be worse today. Because today, in order to meet the actuarial requirements, say 6% or 7% returns in a diversified portfolio, if they've got a big um, chunk of their assets invested in fixed income, they've got to go out on the, the risk curve. They're, they're, they're not buying U.S. Treasuries and getting 2.5%. That's, that's a lock-in loss for them. So they've got to go out on the risk curve. And the further they do out that with more and more credit risk, the more equity-like that portion of their portfolio becomes. So you may not even have the same diversification value with bonds in the portfolio in the next crisis or the next drop in, in values of equities that you had in 2007. So you've, these people have to find alternatives to that. So they're saying, okay, let's, let's create volatility and turn that into an asset class. Well, I, I view this as the Ptolemy-Copernicus conundrum here now. You've got people that have been doing things saying, hey, the, the Earth's the center of the universe. Evidence keeps coming in. Asset classes are the way to diversify. Evidence keeps coming in that that's just not right. You know, with planets, they had, they had these epicycles, and, and they knew for centuries that it wasn't quite right, but they, they, they've kludged it together. Well, Putting volatility in as an asset class is that kludge. It's like adding epicycles to Ptolemy's Earth-centric view of the universe. What you need to do is just step back and say, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to diversify across various return drivers. If uh, the return drivers themselves provide or are based on different events as how they, they earn their money, I'm going to create a diversified portfolio. So <clears throat> return drivers, just to kind of, because I'm kind of flowing into the end here, Return drivers are simply that fundamental source 
of a market's movement. And it can be like sentiment, as I described, or an event reaction, or fundamental marginal cost of production. There's, there's hundreds of potential return drivers that can be incorporated into trading strategies. All trading strategy is, is a return driver turned into a system trading a market. There's certain strategies that are applicable to certain markets. Um, those margin cost of production strategies are great. They're for commodity markets, they're, they're applicable there. They're probably not really good for a currency market. It's uh, the, sort of a purchasing power parity concept, which is a little fuzzy. You know, it's not that direct a, uh, an effect on the price. And then you, di you diversify the portfolio by combining dozens or hundreds of these trading strategies and markets into a balanced, diversified portfolio. Um, <clears throat> this is the last slide. It just, we, we worked this stuff all through the 90s, um, traded strategies, multiple diversified strategies um, that created risk-adjusted returns that were far better than you know, even equities at that time, which were just on a tear. And it, we opened a new fund. We started trading again. I kind of got back into the liquid trading from the venture capital side, launched a fund in July of 2011. And you combine that fund with stocks, which have had a very strong performance over the last year and a half. But even with that performance, when you combine the two, you've got slightly better performance with lo slightly lower drawdown in the portfolio. Uh, going forward, if you have stocks trading at they're sort of a, maybe a normal type return, 7 8% that you might expect going forward the rest of this decade, you'll end up with substantially greater risk-adjusted returns from a portfolio that's diversified across multiple return drivers than you will just trading a, a portfolio that's diversified across multiple stocks. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the story. Um, I don't have any more videos for you, but if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take questions. Guys are quiet. Okay. Uh, Mike, I have a question. Um, how would you compare the diversification that you would get out of your system versus, say, uh, a risk parity system, say, that Brandywine uses or something like that? Yeah, so <clears throat> risk parity, um, that was a, a concept without a name that we employed in uh, 1991 when we were first developing a broad range of trading strategies based on disparate return drivers and needed to come up with a way of allocating across those in the markets in the portfolio. And, and this, is a, this would be a, a subject for an entirely new book, but what we started out looking at was mean variance modeling. We started realizing pretty quickly the serious flaws in mean variance modeling for creating any kind of predictive performance. And all we cared about was predictive performance. So we, we created a model for um, diversifying across the return drivers by allocating risk capital to each of the return drivers so that they all, over time, had a similar impact, uh, risk impact on the portfolio. So what's been bastardized from what we've done with risk parity today and the way that a lot of the, the guys have talked about risk parity today, and, and one of the big risk parity guys I had dinner with 20 years ago when I first talked about how we were doing this, and they turned it into a, a huge business. But they, use it, ask, they do it using asset classes. You know, so they're, they're locked into the same old paradigm, and they got fooled. You know, when you're looking at asset classes and you're looking at risk, you're not necessarily understanding the risk of each of the return drivers. So they ended up with, because the risk was low, overweighted positions in bond markets. Well, that was a great 30-year run. And, but the, the underlying return drivers, you know, what's, what's driving that is starting to shift, and the performance is starting to falter. And so they found that they really didn't have diversification using risk parity that they thought they had in the portfolio. It really wasn't risk parity at all. It was very concentrated risk uh, on the bond side of the portfolio, and they're starting to see that today. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat>